well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rosie, for the presentation. Um, so my name is Adriana Claudio Vasquez, and this summer I've been working at the Renata Lab with the synthesis of the reverse antibiotic angomycin. So a little bit of background. One of the biggest problems in healthcare is that bacteria has an, a great ability to develop and become resistant to antibiotics. One of the examples is the quinoline class antibiotics that is one of the most prescribed around the world. And they target enzymes such as type 2 tocosimerase, DNA DRS, and tocosimerase 4, which are involved in DNA replication processes. When they target these enzymes, they inhibit DNA replication, thus preventing cell growth and causing cell death. But these enzymes have the ability to mutate in the GYRA gene. And when this occurs, quinoline antibiotics are not able to inhibit DNA replication, thus bacterial, bacterial cells start to grow once again. One of the ways to actually uh, target this problem is by using reverse antibiotics. And in 2012, Hermanson discovered that negomycin was able to target these enzyme mutated in the GYRA gene, the same way that um, uh, quinoline antibiotics do. By targeting these enzymes, they inhibit DNA replication, preventing cell growth, and causing cell death. What does, what does uh, this reverse antibiotic action mean? Well, enzyme, uh, nebomycin attacks these enzyme, mutate, uh, enzyme enzymes that mutate. And once they start dying, enzymes to try to prevent this, then reverse the mutation to the original, original enzymes. And by this time, then quinoline antibiotics can also attack these enzymes. So what this means is that the original enzyme can be attacked by the quinoline antibiotic. They, what they do is that they mutate to not pre to prevent the antibiotic to attack them. Nigromycin attacks this mutated enzyme and then it reverses the process. That's why it's called reverse antibiotic action. So the problem with this is that nigromycin is really hard to isolate and it's really hard to synthesize because synthetic organic chemistry has a lot of challenges that make it inefficient to access certain small molecules, such as this one, like nigromycin. And our lab is really interested in using chemoenzymatic synthesis to approach this problem. What these do is that we use enzymes to biocatalyze small molecule modification with higher selectivity. And in 2018, a gene cluster that encoded nigromycin synthesis was identified by Luzeski and collaborators. And what interests us in this biosynthetic pathway is that they identify uh, nigromycin's precursor and the possible enzymes that are responsible for the disymmetrization of the precursor to obtain nigromycin. What they hypothesize is that NIBT or NIBU are responsible of the closure of the oxacillin ring and that NIBB is responsible for the hydroxylation of the carbon at the eight prime position. Because of this, we are very interested in studying if these enzymes are really involved in this oxidative dissymmetrization of the precursor to obtain nigromycin. So my project this summer has been divided into two aims. The first one will be to synthesize nigromycin's precursor, and we were planning on doing this by following the Herger Brothers synthesis that was published a few years ago. To obtain this uh, molecule that's very similar to the precursor but has a methyl ether in this position where the, where the phenol is supposed to be in the in nigromycin's precursor. And we were planning on treating this, this, this compound 7 with boron 3 bromide to demethylate the, the, the ether and obtain the phenol group. After this, uh, my second aim was to use this precursor as a substrate to test the enzymes NIBT, NIBT, NIBU, and NIBB. And previously, Renata has, uh, was able to confirm by SDA's page job that these enzymes are solubly expressed, which let us know that they can be used for subsequent biochemical work, which means we can actually use these enzymes in, um, for experiments to try to do this, uh, to use this option and try to do nigromycin. So following my aim, I started the synthesis with the methylation silation reaction that substituted the hydrogens um, meta to the ether without two methyl to the group and obtained a 73% gel. This product, as well as every other product in my synthetic scheme, was studied by NMR and LCMS, and the peaks and mass corresponded to the product confirming as a reaction. 
This was followed with the iodo desolation of one by substituting the trimethyl group with um, iodo with a 93% yield. And after this, we treated compound two with uh, two, the B2 being two to correlate the, the position where that iodo was. And the group from this reaction is a mixture of the B, of B2 being two and the product that is really hard to separate. So the first time we did this reaction, we obtained around a 42% yield, and we optimized the purification to later on increase the yield to 57%. The next reaction was a Suzuki Coppin reaction with uh, compound three and compound five. Compound five was first ambition to be obtained from the methylation of the two this molecule right here. And, and then the iodation of four to obtain the final product, but this reaction, this first reaction didn't work. We predict that is because the, in the literature they use methyl 99 methanol solution, and this may help stabilize the charges in, in the reaction, but we had a solution of methyl 9 with THF, which is a, a, a product solvent compared to um, methyl as a product solvent, so maybe it's not stabilizing the charges enough, or it's, and it's not moving the reaction forward. So we decided to change this, and we did a coupling reaction with glutaric acid and methylamine to obtain four with a 57% yield, and this was followed by a iodation of four with sodium iodide to obtain five with an 80% yield. And then we proceeded to do the Suzuki reaction that was then obtained initially with an 11% yield, and after optimizing and increasing the scale, we were able to increase the yield to a 25% yield. This Suzuki reaction was then proceeded with a cyclization using a palladium as a catalyst to obtain seven that initially was with a 50% yield. And after repeating the reaction in a higher scale, we obtained a 60% yield. And at this point, um, our next step will be to continue to the last um, reaction of our synthesis, which will be the demethylation of compound seven to obtain the nigromycin precursor. And as I said before, we hypothesized doing this by treating someone with boron 2 bromide. But unfortunately, we tried doing this with different equivalents of boron 2 bromide at different temperatures, and no demethylation could be seen. First, we started with this reaction right here with the sixth equivalent of boron 2 bromide in dry DCM. We added at, at a cold temperature, let it reach room temperature, and then reflux at 40 degrees Celsius. But no reaction at all was seen. We then proceeded to change the equivalents, but using higher temperature. That's why we did. 2.5 equivalents at 80 degrees and 5 equivalents at 80 degrees. 2.5 in the reaction with 2.5 equivalents, we did not see any reaction occurring. And the 5 equivalent reaction, we actually obtained a little bit of uh, um, brominated starting material, probably in the real position, but most of it was just starting material. Um, after this, we increased the temperature to 90 degrees Celsius. We obtained the same result. And then we increase it at 110 degrees Celsius, obtaining the same result again. So we decided to just wing it and go to 20 equivalents of boron 2 bromide at 100 degrees Celsius, but the results were exactly the same. That's why we try also uh, treating it with 48% hydrobromic acid at 110 degrees Celsius. This was done because the, um, we found some derivatives that nigromycin derivatives that were treated with this, and the reaction moved forward, but no reaction was seen. So this may be happening for a number of reasons. For example, maybe the high steric hindrance around this uh, ether from the methyl amide uh, in the sites, but we really don't know right now what's going on. One, one way to move forward may be using um, basic conditions since at such strong acidic conditions, the reaction is not moving forward. But unfortunately, when I got to this point, uh, the summer ended and I wasn't able to continue uh, with the synthesis. So, sorry. The display is six to yeah. Oh, sorry. So in summary, from uh, my summer, I was able to get to 
almost the last step, I, I got to the last step, you know, work uh, of my synthesis. So future work will be to optimize this um, reaction to be able to obtain our final product. As I said before, maybe doing basic conditions, maybe going back to the beginning of the synthesis and using a different um, protecting group for the, uh, for the oxygen layer. And after this, then continue to my second aim, which is using this precursor as a substrate to test the enzymes in IBT and IBU and IBP. Nevertheless, this summer has been a great experience that helped me learn much more about organic synthesis and the, different, um, the difference from learning in front of a book or even a, a paper, literature, and how it's not nearly as straightforward as it seems. You can be, you saw the entire synthetic scheme. It was a lot of work. Um, it may seem safer, but it really isn't. So before I finish, I would like to thank the NSF for funding this research. Special thanks to Hans Renata for giving me the opportunity to be part of his lab this summer and for his, his support and all he taught me. Alex, my mentor, for advising me during the entire summer on my project and other things non-related like how uh, about graduate school and how everything that has to offer for me in the future. Carter style for always keeping an eye on me when Alex wasn't around and for showing me to use the biotech even though I never used it. <laughs> um, I would like to send this thanks to the SIR program, Rosie, Kate, and Paolo for everything they've done for us for the seminars, especially the food. <laughs> and I'm all very thankful for that. I would like to send this gym lab in the curl lab for materials and reagents when I needed them, especially my shulogus and Brenna Ferreira. Group research and last but not least, um, the fellow interns that made this summer so special. So, mm -hmm. Any questions? Any questions? No questions. So do you, you said the last step of your synthesis didn't work. Yeah. Do you know why? Um, it could be because of many reasons. So my molecule has these two amines that have these methyl groups. It may be that there's a high steric hindrance right there, but we're not sure. It may also be that it's just too strong and we need better conditions. But like I said, at this point, it was extreme conditions of 20 kilos of an acid with 100 degrees. Um, maybe just change to basic conditions or try to use a different um, protecting group here. But we're not really sure what actually happened. We just keep doing what we could with what we had at the moment and try to see something work. I actually have a related question. I'm wondering if you have tried to use this alternative substrate in the enzymatic reaction. I mean, given that this is almost the substrate, right? It's maybe not super likely to work, but it's always you know, worth a try. And then a related question would be, if you think it would be at all possible to evolve the enzyme, right, to basically do random mutagenesis, to make, create a whole library of enzymes that um, mute, you know, point mutants that may be, you know, in the hopes of one of them being able to use this as a substrate. Okay, so regarding your first question, I have not tried it uh, using mm -hmm. this, this substrate. Um, and just I we don't know what I, I haven't tried. I just start. I just kept going to what we had mm -hmm. from the beginning and try to just obtain the precursor. And the second question, um, I haven't thought of that, but that's a great combination. And I'll let you know my PI, which I think is watching again. Yeah. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.